Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our talk and demonstration about the Open Weather Project and Nowcast. We want to thank the Open Weather team for all their help. We want to give a shout out to Joel Toms, who collaborated on the Nowcast trailer you just saw. My name is Sasha, and my pronouns are she and her. So today we're going to share our collaborative work as Open Weather. Um, and we want to present the results of the Nowcast that we have co-produced for our networks with 13 collaborators and friends from cyberspace, including people we actually met as part of this festival. So my name is Sophie and my pronouns are she, her. And I want to do a special shout out to Piper, who is working with us on the Open Weather platform. And uh, Piper made sure that we got the Nowcast online in time for our network. So thanks, Piper. Um, so to give you a sense of who we are and where we're coming from, uh, Sasha, slide. So I'm a designer, researcher, and occasional writer, and I'm based in London. And I currently work at Amnesty um, in the evidence lab within the crisis response program. And I became interested broadly in radio in spectrum governance uh, and wired and wireless infrastructures after working with a group of activists who were installing um, an ad hoc Wi-Fi network in uh, the Cali refugee camp in 2016. So since then, I've worked extensively with satellite imagery in my day jobs, initially through a civilian casualty monitoring project called Air Wars, and currently um, at Amnesty in the context of human rights investigations. So to be clear, I'm not a geospatial analyst, neither is Sasha. At Amnesty, I have a colleague, Micah Farfor, who handles the tasking um, and analysis of satellite imagery like a pro. We are, by definition, radio amateurs. Over to you, Sasha. I'm also a creative geographer working at the intersections of environmental justice, community-based activism, and contemporary art. And I hold a lectureship in the Geo Humanities at Royal Holloway University of London. And I became intrigued in radio when I learned about amateur radio communities and when I got my amateur radio license in 2017. Inspired by Lai Yi Olson's talk last year at our, at our networks, we are making a transcript of this talk available on Etherpad for anyone who wants to follow along or who has internet connection issues. You can access the Etherpad at this link, and I think Sophie will copy in the link in the chat as well. Thank you, Sophie. And in our talk today, we're going to do a few things. We're going to introduce open weather and tell you a bit about our collaborative practice. We're going to talk about the collective co-production of the open weather nowcast. And finally, we'll zoom in on the specific dimensions of the Nowcast and say a few words about how we imagine the open weather community and network growing in the future. So open weather is a collaborative research project that probes the porous boundaries between bodies, atmospheres, and weather systems using amateur radio, open data, and feminist tactics of sensing and seance. And at its heart, open weather is about really coming to terms with our bodies as atmospheric entities. So we breathe, we take in elements of the atmospheres around us, and we in turn are affected by our local atmospheres. When we breathe, we are not only inhaling the matters and particles of air, we are also breathing affects, intensities, emotions, pressures and sensations and anything else that animates the spaces in which we live and move. In open weather, we think about the relationships between bodies and atmospheres, relationships that really transcend categories of the material and immaterial, the physical and the affective. Yet atmospheres are far from accidental. They are the consequence of larger weather systems and climates. So when I walk through my neighborhood in London on an unseasonably hot day, I am breathing in an atmosphere that is the result of, amongst other things, 400 years of colonialism and imperialism. The heat in the air, 
that is driving the ever stranger weather is in is the direct manifestation of these racialized and capitalist of this racialized and capitalist expropriation of lands and people of goods and labor over the past centuries so in this way when you really think about the weather and where weather comes from you realize that weather is more than meteorological in other words, it is more than a condition of the atmosphere in time and place. Rather, weather includes the physical aspects of our experience, as well as the forces, powers, and institutions that have re-engineered the weather on a global scale. The weather is more than meteorological. And with open weather, our primary motivation is to do the work and thinking around these intersections of bodies, local atmospheres, and wider weather systems in which we live. So how do we approach these intersections? And I will control the slides now Sasha's absent. So in open weather, we make use of amateur radio, open data, and feminist tactics of sensing and seance. We use DIY technologies and cheap software to read the weather differently to read the weather in all of its more than meteorological complexity, to read it also in a feminist mode, and to write new stories that stress the power relations that are suspended in the air around us. So we've still not got Sasha, which is a shame, but um, I'm gonna carry on and hopefully she'll rejoin us. So Sophie. what do we, hey, Sasha, you're back. I'm back, sorry for that brief, um drop out, but I can carry on from here. So um, Go for it. yeah, what do we mean by reading the weather? So in open weather, it is really important to us not just to describe the weather conditions and all their complexity, but also to engage with the infrastructures and technologies that produce our weather. So today, Earth observation satellites provide the raw data for weather forecasts. We access some of this data through our phones and TVs. Yet these satellites are overwhelmingly owned, operated, and controlled by the very same forces and powers that have contributed to the climate crisis the most. So in open weather, we want to kind of intervene in this weather-making infrastructure. And we discovered two elements early on in the project. First, some meteorological satellites operated by the US are constantly transmitting weather data to the ground. And second, using free or inexpensive radio technology, it is possible to capture and to decode these transmissions. So we decided to use these transmissions from US operated weather satellites as the raw material for the open weather project as the raw material for our questions about bodies, atmospheres, and weather systems. In other words, we use transmissions from US operated weather satellites against their intended purposes to come to terms with the heavy weather of the present. Okay, so I'm gonna talk over the video while it plays. So how does this work? How do we generate this raw material for open weather? We use specific types of antenna, and as I mentioned before, some freely available software. Um, and we also use our bodies to decode the transmissions of NOAA satellites. And here's a clip of Sasha decoding a NOAA 19 pass on the 25th of July in Stuttgart, Germany, where she currently is. So Sasha is using a turnstile antenna pointed in the direction of an orbiting NOAA satellite to capture its unique trans transmission. And the satellite is orbiting above her for about 10 to 12 minutes. And she's using Wix to image software. Um, and she, through the software, she knows its location and also the direction it's traveling in. So the electromagnetic signal captured by the antenna travels down a radio frequency cable and meets an object called a dongle, like this. So the dongle converts the analog signal passing through the radio cable into a digital signal that can be interpreted by software on my laptop. 
on the recording of this process that you're seeing right now, you can see that I'm using two different kinds of software. On the right side, the SDR software or SDR Sharp is showing me what the radio spectrum looks and sounds like at my particular location and with my particular antenna. There are a series of dashed lines and dots moving as if on a waterfall. This is the signal of the satellite, which makes a kind of perturbation on the radio spectrum at 137.1 megahertz. On the left, you can see a window with an image of Europe, which is slowly becoming an image of North Africa. And this is a window from the satellite signal decoding software called Wix to Image. While the SDR software allows me to kind of sense the invisible radio spectrum, the software on the left or Wix to Image takes a kind of piece of that spectrum and decodes it into an image. Even more precisely, I am piping the sound of the satellite from the SDR software to Wix to Image, and Wix to Image is decoding the sound into an image. The decoding process happens in real time. Since radio waves travel at the speed of light, I am decoding what the satellite is capturing almost at the same instant. So what do we in open weather archive from this, pro sorry, achieve from this process. We initially get images like this, and I'm not sure if you can see yet. Okay, so this is a really dark image and it's intentionally dark because this is what the raw data looks like from a NOAA satellite transmission. And the NOAA satellites collect data using an instrument called an advanced very high frequency resolution radiometer, which has six sensors. And these sensors transmit data in two channels. So that's what you can see on the left and the right. Um, on, on the left of the image, you should have the near infrared channel. And on the right, you've got the far infrared channel. And by combining these two channels, if you want, including a base map, uh, the Wix to image software can produce false color images like this. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, exactly. Or like this. These, uh, this is uh, my, Sasha's and my favorite image enhancement. And actually one of the ones we use for the Nowcast. Or like this. And you'll see that these are all over Europe and the UK because that's where Sasha and I are based and that's where our ground stations are. So these images are striking. And as we said earlier, open weather is about probing the porous boundaries between bodies, atmospheres, and weather systems. So we want to complicate our understanding of what is an atmosphere, what is weather, and what is body. So for us, these terms are very much historically situated and fraught with power relations. So how do we move from this really technical and embodied and visual understanding of receiving and decoding satellite transmissions to the realm of critical questioning and community building? So we do that in three main ways. Um, Sophie, I want to take a moment to ask you if your video is on because I can't see you. Maybe it's just me, but um, uh, I'll keep going. OK, just me. Keep so going. we do that in three main ways. Um, we are publishing a series of how-to guides on the community science platform Public Lab in order to enable those without any radio or engineering experience to decode their own NOAA satellite transmissions. By democratizing and expanding this practice beyond the very technical radio communities who already know about it, we seek to conjure new perspectives on both satellite infrastructure and weather sensing tactics. And we published our DIY satellite ground station guide in June 2020, and it really went viral in the amateur radio and open science communities. And this was kind of unexpected for us and also kind of um, brought us to reflect a lot on who is intrigued by this kind of work. The guide is the primary way in which we grew the open weather community in summer 2020. So kind of alongside the guide, in fact, kind of during the creation of the guide, we've also been working on a series of performance 
experiences that bring uh, artistic ways of working um, together with the feminist approaches that we've been developing to ask questions um, about the shared weather we're experiencing and the technologies and power relations that we've just spoken about. So what you can see now is a picture of a satellite seance and another work we also uh, produced and live streamed um, in the first month of the lockdown during London is Open Work Second Body. And that was a collaboration with the author Daisy Hildyard. And so linked to the first two activities, we are really seeking to build new communities around weather sensing and satellite signal decoding. And so to achieve this, we launched the Open Weather Archive, which is an online repository where anyone can submit images and sounds from their weather experiments and thus build a kind of shared resource library of environmental data, as well as critical approaches to weather sensing. So Open Weather has grown a lot in the recent months. And based on our DIY satellite ground station guide, um, many different people have set up their own DIY satellite ground stations from Buenos Aires to Idaho and Mumbai. Um, um, from now on, we kind of want to cohere and strengthen the network. And so for the R Networks Festival this week, we actually activated the Open Weather Network for the first time by inviting collaborators from all over the world to decode satellite passes on Sunday, September 6th and to submit their materials as well as field notes and observations to the Open Weather Archive. So out of the materials submitted to the archive, we've built a composite image of the Earth and its weather systems. And for us, the Nowcast, it really speaks to kind of what we want to achieve with open weather. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, in my mind, it's a counter image to the smooth and seamless globe of Google Earth, which is the one that I see almost every day at work. And it's what the writer and artist Ingrid Burrington calls the forever noon on a cloudless day. So, yeah, and so in these kind of dominant forms of satellite imagery that Sophie was just describing, there are also rarely any patches of noise. In contrast, this open weather now cast um, in this now cast, there is noise, interference, and glitch. The noise is the trace of individual ground stations, radio environments, and bodies who have kind of produced these images. So these situated practices, geographies, and people are inscribed into the individual images and into the collective um, now cast. The dark or blank areas are the parts of the earth that were not imaged, right? So these dark spaces also kind of evoke the partiality of this community effort in earth imaging. In our view, featuring these multiple patchy and noisy satellite recordings from open weather collaborators denies the view from nowhere, as Donna Haraway would call it. And it instead offers multiple entangled views from somewhere the Nowcast is co-created by observers who are very much weathering, and by that we mean experiencing, the conditions they are recording. The images they produce are grounded in and textured, textured by these local realities. And in the case of the observers who contributed to the Nowcast on September 6th, and since we are in the middle of a very uh, kind of violent storm season, you can see that they were also weathering many severe storms, including super typhoon Haishen approaching mainland China and North Korea. That's my favorite image in the Nowcast. Yeah. So although it's much harder to detect and see in the Nowcast, you can actually also pick up the clouds of smoke emanating from forest fires in North America and the Southwest. Um, one of our open weather collaborators, Zach Svetstein, I'm Sasha, am I saying his name correctly? Um, thank you, Zach, uh, wrote in the archive about his experience of wildfire particulate drifting to Seattle, where he is from the Pacific Ocean, originating from forest fires in Oregon and California. 
And similarly, Joaquin Escura, operating from a ground station near Buenos Aires in Argentina, he noted in the archive, um, he said, my pass was recorded on an island in the Sarmiento River, part of the delta of Paraña River, where wetlands have been burning in the last months. And other contributors to the now cast noted political and social climates. For example, Sophia Caffrey, operating a ground station in Marche, Italy, observed, sorry, Marche, Italy, observed, as the temperature rises, the political climate gets heated here in my village. The extremely high temperatures, both during summer and winter, have affected the amount of drinking water available. The local government implemented strategies for preserving water by cutting off supply during the night hours. Collectively, the community is trying to ration water. The shortage and scarcity of it are creating tensions. The fear of not having water or being able to take a shower, wash vegetables or cook meals is growing, particularly during the pandemic when washing hands is an important step. Water scarcity is generating an unsettled climate. Sophia writes. So the full size now cast, as well as the archive to which contributors submitted materials, is available on our newly launched website, open weather.community. And there you can kind of zoom in on the now cast in great detail and also look at the images, sounds, and field notes submitted by contributors. But what are the future steps for open weather and community now casting? One of them is to produce a kind of constantly evolving global weather map that would host not only the situated weather images, but also comments on particular sociopolitical conditions. For example, the atmospheres of neighborhoods and cities, the pressures from, from institutions, the climates people are weathering and the forces of civil unrest that, that we're all experiencing at the moment. And this would be a kind of counter weather map that would bring focus to the partiality of weather and climate observation, while also evoking the multiple material, affective, and political conditions that bodies are continually weathering. So another way um, is to expand and develop the open weather mesh network. And at the same time, we recognize that we're in the very early stages of community building, and we want to be realistic about what community means. Our networks has been a really great opportunity actually to activate uh, this network, um, but the degree to which this network in the future solidifies and coheres remains to be seen. And what we know is that the community science tools that we've been writing and just to be clear, we're very much building on existing tools. So we're more kind of putting them all in one place um, and, and producing accessible guides, uh, something that we really missed during the process of kind of, of figuring all this out. Uh, so these community science tools that we developed and the Open Weather Archive have already helped us generate new relationships and friendships that would not have existed otherwise. And these relationships, uh, again, they cross borders, disciplines, age groups, and demographics. We want to really further explore how an open weather community in whatever form it eventually takes can best serve its members and sustain these relationships. So this brings us um, to the kind of close of our, of our talk, but in closing, we want to thank all of the contributors to the Open Weather Community Nowcast on the 6th of September. These are Audrey Briot, Sophia Caffetti, uh, Sophie Dyer, of course, uh, myself, um, Steve Engelman, my dad, uh, Joaquin Escura, Jacques Gentil, Bill Lyles, El Paul Verhage, Yoshiki Matsuoka, Ankit Sharma, Zach Wetstein, and Wixvids. And of course, we want to thank our networks, uh, especially Sarah Friend, who kindly helped us host um, the Open Weather Nowcast. And thanks to Henry for all the tech support. Uh, and thanks to Gary, who I think is moderating in the background and will be potentially taking your Q&As. So thank you for listening also. Thank Over you. To Henry and Gary. Well, that was great, Sasha. Sophie, thank you so much for your presentation.
Um, this actually brought up a, a number of things in my mind, having looked at SDRs and uh, imaging of the earth. I kind of have this kind of initial question uh, while folks are still typing out their questions in the live chat of, of how do you see this in contrast to something like the perfection of Google Earth or of LiDAR imaging that has been so kind of um, present in how we think about geopolitics and think about geography. This feels like um, a bit of a contrast to that, but is there something more that could be expanded on there? Um, yeah, I'll just jump in, Sophie, then I think um, so people also have things to say, but as a geographer, right, like one of my kind of bread and butter tools is GIS and doing a community-based now cast of the weather in this fashion is completely radically different from the kind of smooth, like totally envisioned, totally sensed globe that we work with in geography. Um, and Sophie quoted the writer Ingrid Burrington, who kind of talks about the always sunny um, Google Earth. So there's no kind of um, even storm systems or kind of noise features in Google's uh, Earth tool. Um, and so we really see that this now cast is not that, it's not, it's not the smooth zoom, it's not the kind of, um, uh, kind of suspended view from nowhere. It is capturing situated views from many different locations and really inscribed in these images are the bodies and tools and orientations of the people doing this imaging work. So I can tell in an image that I've created where I've introduced noise by not pointing my directional antenna in the right direction, right? Um, so there's really all these kind of unique features that can be read in addition to the kind of earth surface that they are also imaging. Sophie? Yeah, so much to say. <laughs> I mean, I look at a lot of satellite imagery um, very much as a kind of lay person, uh, as I said, um, in my day job. And, and I think, yeah, what you picked up on Sasha there about the way in which, particularly if you're using Google Earth, you know, Google Earth uses atmospheric cor correction. So it actually, you know, knits together multiple images from multiple times in order to erase, you know, these storm, storm systems or clouds that might be obscuring the areas you want to look at. So in many ways, it's an illusion that allows us to kind of smoothly move through cyberspace. And of course, it's a completely monetized space. So there's a lot of motivation for that experience to be smooth. Um, but yeah, what we're interested in and why we're kind of embracing the glitches partly is what Sasha said about how on every level, whether it's code, content or infrastructure, these images are really textured by extremely local conditions. Those could be the electromagnetic conditions. Of course, the electromagnetic spectrum is itself a very much an enclosed political space, you know, to get a license to operate, say for high frequency trading, you know, that's a lot. So it, it, it's not it's not a commons, um, basically, although there are narrow areas of the spectrum that are. So so I guess on many on many different registers, we want to kind of make visible um, the, the the politics and the infrastructures behind the imagery. But also, I guess there's this tension between these kind of local conditions that are inscribed in the images and the very much global kind of climates um, that we're all weathering just in very different and unequal ways. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat from Make World, um, and they are interested in how Amnesty International is using radio, as you mentioned, um, if you don't mind going a bit off topic. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really not here in my Amnesty International capacity. Um, I, how it was the question, just how is Amnesty using satellite imagery or radio? Yep. So, I mean, I work in the evidence lab, and I'll just say super quick, because I feel like this isn't, I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go into Amnesty stuff, partly because I'm really new to the organization, but, but yeah, we use satellite imagery um, to monitor, uh, it could be anything from changes in vegetation to the presence of vehicles in human rights investigations, particularly now during the pandemic, when we can't access an area, or it might just be safe to even make contact with somebody in the area to find out what's happening on the ground. So these are kind of remote sensing methods that have been you know, it, it's kind of part of human rights um, bread and butter for many years now. And of course, with enhanced resolutions, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's allowing us to do different things. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, you, you can by all means check out the, the work on the Evidence Lab blog if you want to know more. Well, 
Um, Thanks for the question there. Um, I saw one question, but I think it disappeared on me. <laughs> um, if we yeah. lost something, actually. Oh. I think... Um, I, I could quickly add, I guess, like, is there another question, Gary, or...? Um, not that I see in the chat so far, but feel free to go ahead. So um, I suppose to be more specific, I could talk, ah, oh, Sasha's back. Um, I could say like, for example, we do something called geolocation. And this is something that I did a lot in my last job before Amnesty, where we would look at social media reports of civilian casualties. Um, so somebody saying my brother's been killed here. Um, on this day. And then we would use satellite imagery to try and see if we could correlate that report with visible damage to a building from an airstrike. So, so that's like the kind of the counter where we're looking for like these perfect high resolution images that ultimately we're getting from uh, yeah, massive American uh, corporations that are also yeah, funded by many different bodies. Um, so another question from DC, are there many moments where feminist approaches to civic uh, science have caused you not to proceed past or change course? Um, sorry, the question is, have feminist approaches caused us not to pursue a, a direction or course? Um, mm -hmm. Are there any moments where your feminist approaches to civic science have caused you not to pursue past? Yeah, I think there there have been, um, and uh, yeah, we haven't talked much about this yet. But um, for example, we realized when we published the DIY Ground Station Guide on Public Lab, and we were very upfront with our feminist kind of ethos and approach. Um, that guide it really did go viral in certain kind of spaces. One by of which was. <laughs> <laughs> by by who, Sophie? By our standards, we lost control of its distribution. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, by 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 viral, I mean like, uh, yeah, we had like hundreds of retweets, and it got reviewed in amateur radio blogs, and it got posted on blogs we didn't even know about, and it kind of got reposted and re kind of like um, pushed around the around the web a lot. And one and kind of one particular kind of uh, very popular um, SDR blog did repost our guide, and we actually were quite shocked by the kind of reactions and comments in the forums that were written in response to our guide. Um, I won't quote, but they were kind of denigrating our feminist approach, um, and it really made us like sit and think, like, wait a minute, wow, like so just putting this out in the world and being and kind of it circulating in these amateur radio communities has actually generated a lot of like um, a certain kind of response from certain kind of people that want to police who can or can't be doing amateur radio or uh, signal decoding like we do. Um, but it also really kind of made us reflect around like what is our feminist project in open weather? Is it a kind of like banner waving feminism where we actually do go into forums and chat rooms and we kind of really like try to engage with those who clearly don't want us there? Is it about like changing amateur radio from the inside? Is it about advocating for our principles in very in like ways that we would imagine would then change these technical communities themselves? Um, and we kind of reflected and we found that actually no, that's not what we really think or or want to do in open weather rather we want to kind of build worlds that generate a kind of prefigurative politics to quote max Liboron, a kind of like space in which uh, uh in which more kinds of bodies and more kinds of subjects are welcome and feel invited so we kind of want to build the worlds that we want to see and that we want to inhabit um rather than kind of uh, engaging in certain maybe kind of uh, direct or um, yeah, very direct ways in certain kinds of forums, um, if that makes sense. But Sophie, you will have other ideas about how we've approached feminism. No, you've put it really well, Sasha. And actually, I think we should say also, like, this is the first time we presented this work um, publicly. So actually, for us, this is like, it, this is great, because <laughs> we're, we're having to kind of communicate a lot of the things we've been thinking about for a long time um between yeah and between um each other and our collaboration and i think yeah what you said Sasha, like when we got when we 
when we realized the way in which the guide was circulating and we got some negative responses, we just really decided to double down on the feminist framing and, and really try and yeah frame all the content we're putting out to make clear that this is not just about making a technical guide, it's about thinking differently about these technologies in a critical way and also using them to kind of start conversations. Um, so yeah, so I think, yeah, we, we've kind of become more aware of the importance of framing the work that we put out because we realize that, yeah, if it does what we want it to do, which is to circulate, we ultimately lose we lose control over some of the context. Yeah, and I think we also kind of decided, Sophie, that we want to almost treat our feminist principles like they were a toolbox, you know? So mm -hmm. just as importantly to our antennas, our dongles, our RF cables, just as important to those things are the feminist tools that we use. So we kind of, we have a kind of working document, which is an open weather feminist toolkit, which really makes explicit the specific tools that we take from feminist traditions and how we bring those into open weather. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for for making this the forum in which you you kind of expand and talk through this. It, it makes this a really special uh, event for us. <laughs> um, there are a few more kind of things coming through on the chat, um, and I am talking slowly to give people some time to type it out. Um, but in the meantime, uh, yeah, like I, I think there was something interesting with um, uh, with the kind of representation of the earth, just to double back onto that point. Um, and it makes me think about the work like Charlie Lloyd. I don't know if you've encountered uh, him at all, but yeah. he he, uh, he has this project called, uh, I believe it's called Glittering.blue, which is um, satellite imagery from the Haimaya uh, Waia, uh, Haimaya Waia, Ari, uh, Mario Ari, I uh, ate uh, satellite, which he has uh, composed into his site that it's a really kind of beautiful uh, alternative use of satellite imagery, um, mind you, from a different source um, altogether. Um, no, wait, like I totally wait, missed... okay. Sorry, go ahead, Gary. Oh, um, I totally missed a question here and it just got reposted. So um, is there another connection with a uh, SAT NOGS community? Um, a group building open source networks uh, of ground stations? If so, um, or if not, are there any ways you see these communities as different? Yeah, um, so SATNOGS is actually rather new to us, and we are so grateful for um, Aphrodite Sara and Audrey Brio for um, mm -hmm. both being involved in the Nowcast. So Audrey Brio did submit a, um, an image of France to the Nowcast but also um, kind of flagging to us um, the work of Adriana Knuff. Um, and I believe it was either Adriana or Aphrodite who linked us to a Satnogs um, archive where we were able to kind of explore what exists there. And to be honest, we had not encountered Satnogs before. Um, so I, I don't think we're prepared to like really speak to how open weather can interface with Satnogs, but um, it sounds like a really, really kind of allied project that I think Sophie and I would really like to um, explore further. Um, Sophie? Yeah, no, I think nothing much more to add other than um, this is us kind of like making public the project for the first time. We've done local workshops uh, and we, we've spoken a lot with radio amateurs, um, you know, about the, the tools we're using, the hardware, the software, um, but we actually haven't yet presented it to like in, in this context before and really presented it publicly. So we're learning about these different networks, um, also ladies of Landsat. And I think, yeah, they're 100% our allies. Open weather um, at the moment, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a modest kind of small mesh network of practitioners, some of whom we know, some of whom we met kind of across cyberspace. Um, but yeah, we're, I think, I think all these projects are our allies, um, as you said, Sasha, and, and and it's a fantastic outcome of being involved in our networks to discover other practitioners. I also see Audrey in the live stream chat, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Uh, if there are no other questions, are there any kind of closing thoughts that you want to Close this off. 
I would say, uh, yeah, check back at Open Weather uh, doc community because we are intending to add these critical frameworks, like the documentation of the performance we performances uh, we developed over the last year, and um, we also intend to make the archive something more permanent, uh, and to for the nowcast to perhaps be repeated. Um, so yeah, check back and and thank you for giving us space, uh, Gary, and our networks to kind of explore how we communicate and think through this work.